Unpacking the last of my boxes, I came across a selection of wooden spinning tops, brightly painted, carefully bubble wrapped. I placed them in a ceramic bowl I'd bought in Istanbul and the move was over. I looked at them for a little while. These were not my daughter's spinning tops, they were mine. I'd collected them over many years, bringing the original few to Paris a decade previously, returning now with an expanded collection. Paris is a carnival of problematic perfumes, base notes of overripe Charente melon left in a gutter to rot, bitter mid notes of diesel fumes, sweat and barely restrained rage, top notes of Guerlain et Simiaki. On special summer days, the local town hall would drive a van to the end of my road and open the back doors wide, whereupon operatives on minimum wage would release sweet-smelling oxygen into the atmosphere. I'd hang around there, drinking it in, hoping to somehow imbibe enough in the day to carry on breathing through the stifling nights where the air hung heavy and only mosquitoes moved. I left France eventually and came home to the UK, leaving behind the claustrophobic city of lights for a dose of fresh air under the giant skies of the Somerset coast. I traded the discordant siren of the metro doors for distant seagulls and the roll of waves. After we moved house, I showed my daughter the new sideboard where I'd stored all her board games. She let out an elegiac sigh. Oh, she said, operation. How many hours must I have spent playing that with Anais as a kid? It's a curious thing to watch your own child experience nostalgia for a lost youth, but compelling all the same. There's a quantum leap, you see, between the age of nine and age 11. In parent years, it's gone in the blink of an eye. By the time you've finished sorting out your tax returns, your kids' worlds have changed completely. In the first universe, two friends are whispering in a room full of Mr. Men books with a cache of hidden sweets they think I don't know about and a misspelled note on the door saying, keep out unless you have the secret code. The buzzing of the operation game punctuates the hushed silence and suppressed giggles. That's gone now. In today's universe, my daughter is about to start high school. Her smartphone is in her back pocket and she keeps up with her buddies on Snapchat. And I realised as she knelt, sighing at the careworn operation game, that she'd made the leap from one universe to the other and was looking back across the singularity, staring down the tesseract at her former self. It stayed with me all day and it's been pulling up my trouser hem ever since. When I was a kid, we had few board games in the house, and those we had were held together with sellotape and rubber bands. There was an ancient compendium of games which included some generic classics such as Snakes and Ladders, Ludo and Drafts. I only ever got that out if one of my mum's friends came round with strange kids, and then I had to keep them amused. Then there was Monopoly, Family outings of this time-consuming, stressful game were quite rare. And then there was Battling Tops. This was the best game, and crucially, it was the only one my elder brother would accept to play with me. The game was composed of a plastic arena, a Flavian amphitheatre in bright blue. Around the sides, plastic tops were wound tightly with fishing line, docked. At the call of one, two, three, we pulled on the ripcords and unleashed the spinning gladiators into the ring where they battled for dominance. My brother had convinced himself that superior engineering would ensure continued victory for his preferred top. 
which was called Smarty Smitty. To this end, he had filed down the foot to make the top travel more aggressively and re-engineered the ripcord assembly to deliver more revolutions per minute. My brother had made his own quantum leap years before. He already lived in another universe to me, but battling tops was like a portal, an invisible bridge made of space-time. The tesseract opened up only on rare occasions when the stars aligned in a certain way, but I treasured it all the same. These were the games we had at home, and that was all there was. The games described the limits of the known world. The games were there at the start of my timeline and had always been and would always be. Visits to family friends, however, were like pressing the button for hyperspace. My godfather's house had a game called Downfall and I would sit in trance for whole days playing with his kids, sending coloured counters down a system of wheels like cracking a safe. My parents had friends in Hampshire who we visited once a year, and this house had the mother of all board games, a thing called Mouse Trap. Over many moves, with mouse-shaped pawns, an elaborate Rube Goldberg machine would be built from tiny parts such as legs and bathtubs. At a given moment, its action would be triggered, and a ball bearing would be sent careening around this machine, a complex automaton whose function ended with a basket being brought down on whichever unfortunate mouse had fallen foul of the rules. Many years later, as a callow 18-year-old, I was working my first job, a precursor to the internet. People could ring me up and I would read out the yellow pages. I'd put in for a Saturday morning on time and a half, and when we finished our shift, a colleague from Anglesey called Mike suggested we repair to the Deep Pan Pizza Co. for lunch. And as we rounded the corner of Silver Street, we passed a shop window and I came to a grinding halt. There was Mousetrap. Not half demolished and held together with rubber bands, but all shiny in cellophane wrapping in the display window of some toy emporium. I felt as though someone had burrowed a spark plug directly into my brainstem and pushed down on the kickstart to some weird galactic motorbike. My body began to throb. Oi, Lewis, Mike and the others called. Yeah, coming, I called back. But I walked the remaining distance slowly, deep in introspection. When you're a kid, things are just there. You come online into a world that seems prefabricated and static. Your dad just knows how to drive, food just appears in meal form, and there are just games in the cupboard above the wardrobe in the back bedroom. And although in recent years my attention had been grabbed by exams and girls such that I hadn't given things like this a moment's thought, I suddenly came to the lancing realisation that the universe was not immovable and finite. I have no idea how many years I had silently longed to be in a family that had mousetrap so I could play the game all the time. Now the realisation that I could simply walk into the shop and acquire it, it blew my mind. All those years we could have just gone out and bought the game. I didn't even know where games came from. I mean, as a kid, you only go to the shops your parents take you to, or the shops up the road, you know, to get an onion for your mum. How are you even going to know that others exist? You live in such a bubble. And when you try to say it out loud, you feel so ridiculous. I thought that families just had the games they had, and if you wanted a different game, you had to go to the family that had that game. Of course it's crazy. It seems doubly crazy now that our kids have the internet. They can fact check everything they're told and zoom out from their own existence on Google Earth. But this was the 80s and I had no idea. The irony, of course, was that as I stood staring at the game of mousetrap in the shop window, secure in the knowledge that I could just walk in and buy it and not even feel the price, 
The irony, of course, was that I no longer yearned to play it. My friends had grown up, my brother had moved away, and the game was just a Proustian Madeleine. Something in me wanted to buy that game just to close a circle from the past, but instead I caught up with my pals and went to eat pizza. But what if I'd known way back then the agency I had, the agency you always have, the agency to create and construct your own universe, to not simply accept a set of circumstances as the permanent status quo. Now this moment from my past only really came back to me in memory the other day as I watched my daughter. I can't say whether that epiphany on Silver Street actually was a genuine revelation that caused me to change my outlook on life, or whether it just seems that way in retrospect. But what I can say is that it happened just as I was taking my first steps out into the world and attempting to make a place for myself in it. And what I can also say is that I've had a life in which a defining factor has been a refusal to accept the status quo just because that's the way it's always been. And that's an attitude that has allowed me to solve problems by finding creative solutions. Now, I was just marking time in that Yellow Pages job. I'd already won a place to study social psychology at university, but I deferred the place so I could spend some time working. It was a necessary interlude between periods of study in which I came to understand how I could exercise power over my own situation. And I enjoyed earning money and using purchasing power to change parts of my life. Not long after my mousetrap inquiry, I wandered into a bookshop and found a book by Dr. Eric Byrne. Already more than two decades old when I picked it up, the book was called Games People Play. In it, Byrne sets out his transactional analysis theory of human relationships, a theory that's been influential in modern psychology. Byrne believed that human relationships were essentially transactional and that when two people interact, they're very often buying or selling something. His theory rests on his description of three ego roles, the balanced adult, the parent and the child. Trouble in relationships, Byrne argues, stems from switching between these roles or getting confused over the roles. For example, two adult colleagues of equal status work alongside each other, but one of the colleagues talks down to the other like a controlling, disapproving parent. How many times have I told you to file the report this way and not that way? The other colleague responds like a child, throwing tantrums at the unfairness. Well, I won't file it at all then. See how you like that. Dysfunction ensues. Two balanced adults in the same situation would simply have cooperated to get the filing done correctly. By the way, we're about halfway through, so maybe time to start heading back. Now, Byrne felt that people engaged in many different kinds of theatrical mind games, the games people play from the title, involving these ego roles, games that enable the players to get what they want from the transaction. The friend or romantic interest who shows up on your doorstep with suitcases crying, oh, I've been thrown out of my flat, can I stay with you? Well, this person is playing a game pitched from her child at your parent, a game that Byrne called Threadbare. White's made the opening move, now what's Black's move? Well, Black decides to play the game as parent and takes the girlfriend in, oh, poor you. But now, of course, Black has to look after this adult child who ought to be sorting her own life out. So in this transaction, White has bought the right to cry, why does this always happen to me? And she doesn't care about the cost to Black. 
Black could refuse to play this game, and so the adult might say, I'm sorry, I can't help you with that, but you're welcome to come in and use my phone and book a hotel. Here's another one. This one uh, plucked straight from Burn. A man calls a plumber to fix his sink and the plumber quotes £300, promising no hidden extras. But when the plumber goes to buy the part, he realises he underestimated the cost by £2 and so submits a finished bill of £302. Furious at the transgression, the customer refuses to pay the bill at all. The plumber won't back down, so the customer writes a furious letter attacking the plumber's professional ethics until finally the latter gives in and lets the customer get his way. Now, Byrne called this game, Now I've Got You, You Son of a Bitch. In this game, the player is far more interested in the rage and power this tiny mistake allows him to rain down on the plumber than he is in rectifying his original problem. In fact, once this game has begun, the player has little incentive to resolve, since this would end the game. Meanwhile, the plumber is also playing a game which Byrne calls Kick Me. The bill with the added extra is a provocation, inviting his opponent to kick him. The payoff to this game is that the plumber, just like the girl in Threadbare, gets to throw up his hands and cry, why does this always happen to me? What well, it happens to you, of course, because you keep provoking it. So for the plumber, the adult ego role would have swallowed the extra cost and said nothing to the customer. A promise is a promise, right? For the customer, the adult well, would have paid the £300 that was owed, even if he disputed the extra two, because the job was still done and he'd agreed to pay that much for the job. But the game player is more interested in having the plumber at his mercy, and secretly he's delighted at this tiny transgression as it gives him a chance to vent his pent-up fury. I've had clients like this. In fact, I've developed a special system for payments to avoid these players messing me about. Here's how it works. The client orders, uh, let's say, a logo in green for £300. I do the job as specified. The client says, oh, that's great. Only now that I see the finished work, I think I'd rather have it in blue. I say, well, that's no problem. Just settle up your bill and I'll quote you to change it to blue. It won't be much more. No way, they say. We've told you we don't want green. We're not paying for something we don't want. And that's the key phrase, isn't it? Telling themselves they're being forced to pay for something they don't want allows them in their mind to start playing Now I've got you, you son of a bitch, and unleash their rage. You're unprofessional. You're dishonest. We're not paying anything at all until you give us what we want. And hop, we're right into Burns game almost word for word. Should I acquiesce and make that change? Well, the matter's still not resolved. The client then continues to hold that payment over me indefinitely, demanding change upon change. But each attempt to satisfy them by doing what they want just makes them madder. Because they don't want the resolution, they want to keep raging. The changes are not needed, they're simply ways to extend the game. It falls to the adult ego persona here to devise a contract that includes a system of milestone payments triggered at specified points in the job such that when the client tries to play this game, they realise they can only withhold a tiny amount of the fee that remains outstanding. If I can't bring them back into the adult role, well, at least it gives me the option to cut my loss and, and run with minimal damage. Because life's too short to feed the troll, right? Byrne writes that these mind games being played on us all the time exhausts and depletes us. It may be that we have many relationships that are predicated on such games. And we may even be playing them without realising it. Let's just take that one game, Now I've Got You, You Son of a Bitch, which Byrne abbreviates to N-I-G-Y-S-O-B. How many times have we found ourselves caught in the crosshairs of one of these N-I-G-Y-S-O-B players? 
I had a boss once, let's call him Bob. Bob owned his own company and should have delighted in the success of his employees because their success made him money while he slept. But he did not delight in their success at all. Indeed, he reveled in their failure and did everything he could to set them up to fail. He developed an intricate Kafka-esque system of grading and scoring in which it was nigh on impossible to pass. Jobs that were close to perfect and could have been sold straight away would be rejected for spurious transgressions. Bob would then relish holding the employee's hands to the fire over the one tiny thing that wasn't perfect, humiliating and demoralising them until they left. But it seems so counterintuitive, doesn't it, and counterproductive. Why on earth would someone smart sabotage their own business in this way? Until you understand that for Bob, the real currency in this transaction was not saleable quality work, but a constant source of captive players for his game. And then you think to yourself, ah, okay, I get it. Bob probably spent his entire childhood trying and failing to win approval from a withholding parent and now he's trying to even up the score of that game with every poor sucker who comes into his orbit. But by understanding what's happening in these games, Byrne argued, you can exercise agency over the universe of relationships that you live in and have a happier time. Recognising the games does help. The player is trying to fashion a universe in which they get to play their game all the time. They don't care about the cost to you of playing those games. But if you really understand these games, then you can easily spot when one begins. You can then understand what the player's motives are, what their end game is, and what moves they expect you to make. You can then choose to play their game with them, you can refuse. If nothing else, being able to spot a player in the throes of one of these games helps you to understand that when these people play these mind games on you, it's actually all about them. And it's not about you. And this is precious intelligence that stops the game player from doing you damage. That's the idea anyway. And I don't want to say any more about Byrne and his games today because I don't want to get into relationships until season two of 30 Walks. The idea here is to give you some of this vocabulary and let it go to work. I think we'll come back to it later once you've had a chance to ruminate on it a little. Anyway, Byrne's book fascinated me and it took my mind off where I was living. I was unsatisfied with where I grew up. I never fit in with its pebble dash, although I tried. But one year, when we were 15, our school took us away on a French exchange and I lived in a French family deep in the countryside of the Charente. I liked it there, and on one of the days we were taken in a bus for a road trip where we stopped in a pine forest clearing to eat a picnic lunch. It felt very far away indeed from our brutish suburb of cracked asphalt and I was fascinated by the soft substrate of fallen pine needles on sand, by the filtered sunlight dappling the ground, the call of the cicadas and something else, something farther off in the distance. What was that? As I walked towards it with my pals, we came suddenly out of the forest in a vast deserted sandy beach opened up as far as we could see from left to right. That sound was the hissing of the surf. Above the dunes, a lighthouse towered over us, red and white stripes. I had no idea where I was, but I was transfixed. I pulled out my Kodak Instamatic camera and set the exposure to sun. That picture of a random lighthouse lost in a forest somewhere in my childhood became one of those treasures that you keep. Child years are so much longer than adult years and by the time I was 20, the yellowing photo was a peeling relic from a former life. 
And yet, when I looked around and asked myself where I would go and what I would do in life, the picture spoke. That was the year I spent the spring and the summer in a tent on the Atlantic coast of France working on a campsite at the foot of that lighthouse. On sunny days off, I would take my mobilette and buzz up and down the coast. On rainy days, I would dig a trench around my tent, put the gas cooker on and draw. It was my first ever experience of using my own personal sense of agency to create an alternative universe for myself, and I liked it. That summer in France sparked off a fascination with the country that persuaded me finally to live there for more than a decade and start my own family there. I'm not sure where battling tops is now. I know I don't have it. It's possible my parents gave it away or perhaps it ended up in some sidewalk sale. An awful lot of stuff from childhood disappears. So much jetsam, in fact, falls over the side that I do sometimes marvel at just how much we manage to drag with us into adulthood. I watch my daughter looking over her small collection of board games. The funny thing is, she said suddenly, Operation isn't even that good a game. Well, she's right, of course, it's rubbish. It's the sort of thing you buy one year when your daughter's tiny for a stocking present without thinking about it, imagining that you'll get more games. Somehow, time passes, life intervenes, you forget to get more games, and over the years, a view of the universe has developed in which Operation, the most random of acquisitions, is the immovable ancient column that always was and always will be. I look at my daughter. I'm impressed at the speed with which, when faced with the opportunity to lament a lost past, she processes, relativizes, and concludes that the present is a better space. Time for some new games, I ask. (laughs) You bet, she says. So I sit thinking about how maybe the time has finally come to close that ancient childhood circle and buy mousetrap. I'm thinking that I should check Amazon or, no wait, check eBay and get the original 1965 version. And while I'm at it, I should probably get downfall if I can find the original with all the pieces intact. And while I'm clicking away, suddenly my daughter says, why do you have 12 spinning tops in a bowl? And I'd never asked myself that question, but the neural pathway suddenly forged. My brain has access to new information. And I'm instantly transported back to the dining room of my parents' old house, the 70s curtains we kept all the way through the 80s, the wonderful oval beach dining table that my sister now has, and that bright blue coliseum of spinning gladiators. Ha, I say, you really don't know why I have these? Uh, no, Papa. All I know is, for some reason, as long as I can remember, you have a bowl of spinning tops. Go to your cupboard in the kitchen, I say. Fish out your 12-inch cake tin. Off she runs and brings it. Now select your spinning top, I say, the one you think is best. My daughter and my partner now both select a top. I pick mine. On your marks, get set. I launch my top spinning into the cake tin, and the others follow suit. The tops dance around each other like humming hornets, and then strike, throwing each other into the air. 